looks like when we go to this map, it's a neural net that we have to like, just add a hidden layer, set the hidden layer size, and then kind of keep building it all over that. Yeah, have you, uh, did you look at the, um, like, the demo 2 video? Like, the three video? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you just take those nodes, then you like, formulate like, what they do with the software. Okay, so that should be easy to kind of replicate for yeah. that. Yeah. We just have to change our input each time because he has like static input. So we would just write Dart into a tensor, like one dimensional tensor, so it's a vector and then replace that. <laughs> a couple more minutes and then I'll start. There's any traction with that research anymore right now, though. He also he's don't he's old, that Optimal is his. Well, good news for him. He's going to open source all the Optimal Yeah, Optimal Yeah, Optimal Brew. He was like, yeah, one day, if I can, he wants to make it so that you can, like, essentially pair people with what kind of beer they want, brew it, and send it to them. Are you sure you're not confusing me with him? <laughs> How's this? Going? That's my whole business idea. He already owns the domain. You know, if you partner up with him, I'm sure he'd be happy to have someone continue the research. He's got a he's got a bunch of data. Yeah, he's also got a bunch of uh, research students that don't get paid anything to do work for him. Yeah, it's a great business. I don't with that. Yeah, I do. <laughs> okay, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Everyone's ready. Okay. So hi everyone, my name is Rochelle. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about how to deploy a React application on Kubernetes. Uh, just to get a show of hands, how many people are familiar work with React? Okay, a couple, good. So we'll, we'll go over the basics um, and what it is, and then how many people have experience with Kubernetes? Okay, so a couple. Okay, so this is a very like introduction um, presentation for both of it, so hopefully you guys can just follow along, kind of get the basics, and then at the end, um, I'm going to show how you guys can get it up on like IBM Cloud and whatnot. And then if you guys want to follow along, the slides are um, right there, and then the GitHub repo, which is what I'm going to be going over, that you guys can deploy, is there as well. But these are going to be up um, on my last slide, so, but just if you want to follow along. So a little bit about me, I was previously a front-end developer at IBM. Uh, so I worked a lot with React, not a lot of, you know, deployments or whatnot. So at IBM, 
how it works is we have like a front end team, a back end team, a DevOps team. So I was all front end, didn't really do much deployment. And then now I'm a developer advocate. So we are in charge of containers and Kubernetes, talking about it, teaching people about it. So that's kind of how I got my experience with React as well as Kubernetes. Uh, and then just a couple fun facts, my first time in Washington. So especially in Bellingham, I've never been here before. And then this picture, I know it's kind of dark, um, but this was where James Bond was filmed, Skyfall in the Scottish Highlands. So, so it's pretty cool. So as a developer, I was always lost in the process of deploying something on Kubernetes. So, you know, as a front developer, or just as a developer, um, you can deploy things like static generators. I don't know why it keeps going on and off. I was doing that earlier, so hopefully it doesn't do that too much. It will be changed the resolution in the refresh rate. Oh, okay. Well, hope I'm not touching it at all. Let me see. The display. Sorry about this. <laughs> I'm just going to keep going along with it, um, and we'll see what happens, because now I can't control it at all here. Okay. Yeah, so try that. So hopefully that works. I guess we'll see. Okay. So hopefully that works. So um, as a developer, I was always lost in the process of deploying an application on Kubernetes. So you know, with static generators like GitHub, Netlify, those are pretty simple. You know, you kind of just click a button and it goes right up there. Cloud Foundry. You just need a manifest file. So those are pretty simple, but Kubernetes provides a lot more than those for managing your applications and whatnot. And you know, it's becoming a really big, hot commodity. So I kind of wanted to learn Kubernetes. So all the documentation was different. So it was really frustrating because I would read one thing and it would say, this is how you deploy it. And then I'd read another thing and it would say, no, this is how you do it. And the first time I did it, I wanted to do it without a YAML file. So if you guys have heard of Kubernetes, it's like all the YAMLs, which I, I just didn't want to deal with that. Um, so especially for that, everything was different. So it, it was kind of really frustrating. So for me, it took me almost like a week to finally get a simple app deployed. And that's like, that's ridiculous. It shouldn't take you know a whole week just to get an application deployed. So that's kind of why I created this code pattern so people can get it up, get something running really easily, you know, takes a couple minutes, or not a couple minutes, but it's really quick and rather than wasting your time a whole hour. And then this also saved hours of my time and energy. So rather than a week, now I can get something up, you know, maybe an hour or so. And it was just nice to not have to always stress about deploying something, how it all worked. So what about a little bit about this code pattern. So it's built on React, that's the foundation. So if you're not familiar with React, um, it's JavaScript, it's based on Node. So it's just a JavaScript library on top of Node um, and it is for creating user interfaces. And then it has a Redux state management. So Redux, you'll see it a lot of times um, with React, but you can do it with other JavaScript libraries as well. Basically, it just makes sure that it manages the state among your whole application. And then it has one, it just makes one API call. So it gives a little complexity, but um, I'll kind of show you that in a second. And then it has Docker support. So I won't be going into Docker today, but if you guys want to look at the GitHub repo, you can see how to build that image, how to get it up on Docker, and then you can use like Docker Swarm or whatnot, see how that all works. And it also has Kubernetes deployments. So this is the support on there, the instructions. So this is specifically what I'm going to be going over today and how you can do that. And then it's built on the IBM Cloud. So that's what we're going to be using. How many people are familiar with IBM Cloud? Probably not. No one. I expected that. Um, so yeah. So, you know, of course, it's like AWS and Google, um, 
the Google version as well, but specifically I'll be showing you on IBM Cloud. So React is a JavaScript library for building user interfaces. So um, if you're familiar with it, there's other libraries as well like Angular or Vue. Those are becoming big. React is really popular. It was created by Facebook and recently open sourced. Um, so at least for us at IBM, we're using it a lot. That's our main JavaScript library that we use. And then it functions as the view layer. So if you think of like an MVC architecture, it mainly functions as that view layer. And it's component based. So this makes it, this is one of, I guess, the big things that people like React. Everything is created with components. So if you have an application, let's say you have a form, everything's going to be built on components and it's going to be very modular. So this really helps when you're debugging it or you have to make changes because rather than going through a file that has like a thousand lines of code, you're going to have little components that you know probably has less than a hundred lines and you can go in and quickly make changes. And it has the virtual DOM. So this is another one of the big things about it. Um, so basically what it does is it makes an abstraction of the DOM and then it only, and then it'll compare the virtual DOM and the DOM and anything that changes, it'll only re-render those changes. So for example, if you click a button and a modal comes up, it's only going to re-render that modal that's changed. It's not going to re-render that whole page. So as far as performance wise, like it saves you a lot of time, it's a lot more efficient. And then if you have a lot of moving parts as well, that's really helpful for it. And then it's declarative, so this kind of goes with a virtual DOM, but rather than you having to tell the application how to re-render it, it just does it automatically and it makes it simpler that you don't have to tell it how to do it. And then it's based on JSX, so this is just kind of like a file type, um, mostly JavaScript, but it does have HTML-like syntax, so within your JavaScript file, um, you know, you're gonna, you, you'd have divs, you'd have like paragraph elements, but this just makes it so you don't have an HTML file as well as a JavaScript file. You can do it all at once, keep all the logic, and it kind of makes it easier so you don't have to go back and forth between two files. So imagine we're building a house like an application. So I'm kind of going to go through a house building process and compare it to um, React and then how that um, coincides with Kubernetes. <laughs> So this would be like your architecture diagram. So the biggest piece you have is your house. So let's say that's your application. It contains all the code, all the configuration. Um, and then at the end of this, that house is going to be our deployed application. So getting that house built is what we want at the end. And so we're going to kind of see how you can break it down into React components and then how Kubernetes fits in with it. And then so let's say all the rooms, and specifically a kitchen, it's going to be like a microservice. So I know. You probably hear microservices all the time. Um, but we're going to, basically, that's a coupled service. So if we have an application, let's say that has a front end, a back end, a database, all of those different things are going to be microservices. So let's say for this house, each room is a different microservice. And with all those microservices, builds the house of the application. And then the appliances. So specifically, I'll be going into like the kitchen and kind of comparing those. Um, but that's kind of our container in the React world. So containers handle all the logic, and it basically passes down to the components. So containers are the ones that interact with Redux. It has all the state. It's a little bit more logic rather than presentational UI components. And the components, it's the smallest piece. Uh, they're independent, use, reusable elements. Um, so mostly they're just presentational. So it just kind of has styling and whatnot and then the logic gets passed from the container to the component. So this is a picture of a kitchen. So specifically, like, <coughs> pay attention to the stove. So the stove would be like a container. And then, because you know the stove, it's comprised of stove burners, it's comprised of an oven, it's comprised of you know, the dials that you need to change it. So for example, if the stove is the container, then the stove burners would be the components. So you usually have like two to four stove burners. So if you think about it, those are all reusable. They're the same exact thing. It's just like multiple of them, right? And then the stove burner doesn't have any logic in it. It takes, when a user turns on this oven, or turns on the stove burner, that's coming from the stove. Rather, you don't really do anything with the stove burner. So the React container. So I'm going to use the stove example as my container. But it's made, made up by smaller parts. 
So it's made up by, again, I said like the oven, the stove burner, everything like that. And then when you think about containers, it's made up of smaller elements called components. So each container that you have, you're going to have multiple components or one component, however many you need to make up a container. And then it manages everything within its ecosystem. So again, that stove, if you're turning on the oven, it manages that. If you're turning on a stove burner, it manages that. It manages everything within its container world. And that's the same with you know, regular containers. It manages all the data. So make sure that you don't have any logic in your components. Make sure that all the logic is being done in the container and then you pass it down. So it's like a top-down trickle of events, you could say. And then it passes the states to smaller parts. So again, like I, I was saying, um, the stove passes the state, which would be, let's say, the stove burner's on. It's going to pass that state to the stove burner. And then for containers, it passes all the data as prop types to its component. So if you have an application that has a container, and let's say on a button click it did an API request, um, with the response, it would be handled in the container, and then that response would be passed to the component as a prop type. And then the React components. So let's treat the stove burner as a React component. It's a reusable piece. So like I said before, you'll have four reusable components, stove burners. So it's really just like what it looks like and what it does. And the components are reusable in multiple parts of an application. So because they don't have any logic, it's not tied to a specific part of your application, you can kind of use it wherever. And then it receives data and the state from the stove. So again, if you're turning on the stove burner, it receives that, you know, um, state, I guess you would say, to the stove, and then it would turn on, which is the same thing for components. It receives data and state from the, from the container. So like I said before, if you have an API request, that response is going to trickle down to your component. And then it accepts that data from the containers through the props. So I mentioned this in the last one, but it's basically the one receiving those prop types. So a separation of concerns allows an application to be easier to manage and provides cleaner code. So um, I was part of a project where we didn't have the separation of concerns. We kind of just had logic everywhere, and it made it really messy. And when you're dealing with like tens of files that all have like a lot of code in them, it can get really messy and really confusing. So every time we had to make you know like a UI change or the back end changed. Um, it would take us like a while to go in and change it. But if you know that the containers have all the logic and the components just have the presentational UI, then it's easier to go through and make changes and then just keep that separation. So regarding React, not everyone does this. Um, it is a best practice, but not everyone does it. It just makes it easier and cleaner. So Redux, so it's the JavaScript library for managing the application state. So the application as your whole, if we're thinking about um, you know, that kitchen, or if we're thinking about a microservice, let's say the front end, it manages all the state. So, so there's these things called actions. They describe that something has happened. So basically, you know, if you have a button click, that would be the action. The button was clicked, which then sends it down to the reducer, and the reducer updates that global state. So when you know, we've had a button click, let's say, um, the state that's changed is just button clicked. Um, the reducer would change that state in the store. So the store holds all of the application state for every component and every container. So basically what that means is um, the store, you know, for all the components and all the containers, all those states are in the store and they can't be, they're immutable. So you can't change them. You have to always go through the action and the reducer to update that store. So this is a little diagram of how Redux works. So um, you'll see the UI. So when the UI is triggered, let's say a button click, then that action is called, which basically says the button was clicked, and then that's set to the reducer. And, in, and the reducer is where you say what the state changes to. So the button click, let's say, um, it turns a state on. When you click it, when you unclick it, it turns it off. So that's what's going to go in the reducer, and, the, and then the reducer is what updates the store. And then it kind of just goes in that loop, in that circle. So now I'm going to kind of show you, so back to this kitchen metaphor. Um, 
So a user would turn on a stove burner, so that would trigger the action, right? It would say the user has turned on the stove. And then the turn on stove would be the action, and then that's, that state is sent to the re reducer. So now that the stove is on, that's what's sent to the reducer. And then the state of the stove is on, which updates the store. So among the whole application, if you need to somehow interact with this state anywhere, you can. So that's the good thing about Redux. It's not like isolated to one component or one container. But if you want specific component states, you can have that as well if it doesn't need to be global. So this is really good when you're doing API requests. So you can send that response around the whole application. Or if multiple of your multiple components or containers need that state, then that's when you should use Redux. So this is the code pattern that um, I'll be talking about. So in this specific example, so it's really simple. You just put in a title of a movie. It calls the OMDB API, which if you guys have heard of IMDB, it's not the same thing, but it'll return like the information of a movie. So you put in the title and then you press search and then something will come out, the response. So how I've broken this down is you see the, compo or the two components are the input and the button, which is all in a container. So basically what happens when you input a title, that's going to be saved in, as a state. But it's not going to be saved as a component. So any time that you are interacting from the component to the container, you do a callback to the container. So that the title of the movie, is that state's always going to be in the container. It's not in the component. I know that's kind of confusing. Um, but yeah, so every time you have to send that data back, you have to do it in a, uh, in a callback. And then here, so this is what happens when you put in the um, title and then you press search. So this is where kind of like Redux happens. So the search, it'll trigger the action when you click it, which is the OMDB API request. So you call that in Redux, which then says this button was clicked. And then it'll send that um, response to the reducer. So as you see here, that's the response we got back from the API request. So this is what the reducer gets back and basically tells the store this is the new response. Any questions on that? I know it's kind of confusing. If any questions, yes? Uh, is the store in the context of the container? Are there multiple stores or is it just a? There's one store. It's like a global store for the whole application. Oh. So like if you want to save um, certain states for like a particular component, you could just save it in that component. You don't have to use the store. But if, you know, if there's a lot of, you know, production applications that have a lot, of, a lot of logic, so if you need a global state that crosses among multiple components or containers, that's when you would use the store. Does yeah. that make sense? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions right now? Okay. So now we've kind of gotten the React Redux out of the way. I know it's, it's very high level. Um, but now we are going to deploy our application. And we're going to do it without a YAML file. Uh, so the first time I did this, I didn't want to deal with a YAML file. Basically, it just says all your configurations for a deployment or for a particular service you're doing. And as a first time, we're like, it's a lot to kind of understand. So I'm just going to show how we do it through the CLI. So Kubernetes, it's an orchestration tool. So basically what it does is it automates the deployment, and then it manages the deployment and containerized applications. So how many people are familiar with like containers, Docker, understand the concept of containers? OK. Um, so I'll, I'm not going to go over any Docker stuff, but I'll kind of briefly touch on what containers are and how it fits into this architecture. So if we go back to that house metaphor, Kubernetes is like the house builder in charge of scheduling and managing a house. <coughs> so let's say that all our different rooms, those are containers. So what containers are, um, you know, if, you, if you've used Docker or anything like that, it basically has your different microservices, it packages it up as an image, and that's what's deployed out on Kubernetes. So if we're doing, you know, the home builder, so the home builder is the one that tells everyone, you know, how they're going to schedule to do a house. If something breaks, they automatically fix it. It's kind of all those different things that go into building a house. And then there's some Kubernetes definitions that you'll need to know. So the first one is a cluster. So that's kind of the biggest element within Kubernetes. You're going to create a cluster, and it consists of the cluster master and multiple worker machines. So these worker machines can be physical machines. They can be virtual machines. 
anything like that. And then this is kind of like the home builder company. So they're the ones that are, you know, telling their workers how to do everything. They're the ones scheduling and everything like that. And then the node. So if the cluster is the biggest element, it's contained of nodes. So these are multiple worker machines that run the application managed by the cluster master. So each application you can think of as a container. So if we're doing the microservice architecture, all the services would be in a container and then the nodes would run those different containers. And this is kind of like the home builder employees. So they're the ones, they're the ones in charge of you know, making sure they build the house, they build the different rooms. And then last is gonna be the pod. So it so usually doesn't contain one or more containers. Usually it's one container per pod. You can do multiple, but then it's a lot of baggage that you probably don't want to deal with. Um, so usually for a pod, it contains one container, and that's what's going to run on um, Kubernetes. So Kubernetes creates an abstraction around a container called a pod. So rather than having to actually directly manage a container, you manage the pod, which contains the container in your application. So the pod would be like a room. So you know, for each microservice, you're going to have it in a pod. So what challenges does, does Kubernetes solve? So the first one is what happens if my app crashes. So I'm sure everyone can relate to this. Like you don't want to get a 3 a.m. call talking about how an application crashed. So how does Kubernetes help fix that so you don't have to get that 3 a.m. call? And then how can I roll up updates or rollbacks? So updates, you know, every application usually has to be updated. So how does Kubernetes manage that? And then if you do an update and there's a bug, how do you easily and quickly roll it back? And then what happens when you get a high influx of traffic? So I'm sure you guys have had experience with just getting like a lot of people on the site that maybe you didn't expect, maybe it crashes your app, anything like that. So how does Kubernetes help with that? And how does it make sure that your app doesn't crash? And then the last one, so microservice architecture I've touched on today, but you know, it's a lot of people are using it now rather than the monolithic approach. So how does Kubernetes kind of work with that so you don't have to deploy this monolithic application so you can kind of manage each microservice individually? So the first challenge, what happens if my app crashes? So it provides monitoring for pod health and restarts them in case of failure. So for each pod, which like I said is a container, which is an application, um, it monitors that automatically and if it'll check the health and if one of them goes down, it'll automatically restart it. So I've, I've actually had experience with this one um, when my pods crashed and everyone was kind of like, what's going on? But then it automatically restarted like a, a few seconds later. So it wasn't really a big deal, you know, I think with probably like Cloud Foundry and some other ones, if it crashes, it's just kind of down and you have to manually go in there. But with Kubernetes, it automatically does it. And it's always monitoring your pods so you could see if it's healthy, if you know something's wrong with it. And then the second challenge is how can I roll out updates or rollbacks? So basically, <coughs> um, how it does updates is when you want to update, it will incrementally um, provision the pods for you with that update so you have zero downtime. So with an application, if you're rolling out an update, rather than having to take it down, then put it back up with that update, it'll just incrementally do it. So the user can't notice that you know it's down, coming back up, so that's really nice. And then what happens when I get an unexpected high influx of traffic? So it automatically scales your pods, so as long as you have you know enough space within your cluster or whatnot, um, it'll automatically scale it. So if you get a lot of traffic, it will, you know, bring up provision multiple pods to take care of that traffic so it doesn't go down. And then the last one, what will work best for my microservice architecture? So this is, it's more based on containers and Docker and that architecture rather than Kubernetes specifically. But um, since your microservices are packaged into containers, those are deployed as pods on Kubernetes. So, I mean, Kubernetes uses that container architecture, so it's more that rather than actually Kubernetes doing anything. But if you have a microservice architecture and all of them are you know, individually deployed as pods, your whole application isn't gonna crash. If one pod goes down, that's not your whole application. That's just like a piece of your application. It's probably pretty important, but you know, it's not as big of a deal as your whole application crashing. 
So now I'm kind of I'm gonna give a demo. It's an ish demo. Cause it's not a live demo, um, but I'll show you kind of each step that you have to do to get something deployed on Kubernetes. And this, these are some of the deployment prerequisites. So you'll need an IBM Cloud account. Uh, install the IBM Cloud CLI, and then install. There's two plugins: the Container Registry and the um, the other one's not up there. The Container Registry and there's a Container Service that you'll need to both um, install. Because I'm going to show everything through the CLI, and then you'll need to install the Kubernetes command line tool called kubectl. So first, you need to create a Docker file. So if you guys are familiar with Docker, then you guys should know what the Docker file does. Basically what the Docker file does is it has all these commands that are used to build an image because when, what you do with that built image, that's what's deployed with the container. So this is an example of in that code pattern what I have. So because it's based on React, you know, it has a node base image. So you always need to specify the base image and then set the working directory. And then since this is based on node, I use npm, so it's going to do the npm install everything that you need, um, depending on your application. That obviously changes depending on the dependencies you need. And then you're going to expose the port. So this one's pretty important. Um, I expose a different port in my Docker file to when I deployed Kubernetes. So I spent like an afternoon trying to figure out why it wasn't working. And it was just like a super small thing. Um, so make sure that your ports are the same. And then however, you have to start your app. So this one's npm run start. but what however you have to start your app. So basically these are all the commands that you would use you know, on your CLI to run this particular application. So next we create our Kubernetes cluster. So I'm going to show you through the IBM Cloud uh, UI. You could also do it through the command line, which I just found out yesterday, so I didn't have time to update these. Um, but you could also do it through the UI. So once you have an IBM Cloud account, you go to the catalog and then you just put in Kubernetes. So it's containers and Kubernetes cluster. We offer a free one node, which, so if you're doing like this application, if you're only doing one application, one node should be fine. If you're trying to do multiple, you're going to need multiple nodes. Um, but for, you know, just testing it out, we offer the free cluster for one node. So then you create that cluster. And then this is what the dashboard looks like. Um, so I did three nodes just because I, I didn't do the free one. Um, our team is out of free, uh, of free clusters. So, um, but yeah, so this is what's going to show you what the nodes are doing. So here you can see all my three nodes are ready. But this is what I was kind of talking about, how it monitors each node and each pod. Because it'll go, like, if it's warning or critical, then, you know, something's probably going wrong. So you can either look at this through the dashboard or just through the CLI if you just want to do everything there. And then next, so in your command line, you need to get the uh, cluster config because you need to say, hey, this is where I want to point to to deploy everything. So you do BX, CS, cluster config, whatever your cluster name is. And then it's going to output something like this. So this is the cube config. So you basically copy and paste that into your CLI and it kind of says, hey, this is the cluster that I want to point to because if you have multiple clusters, it doesn't know which one you know you want to deploy to. And next, create a namespace. So this is um, IBM specific. Uh, we have a container registry service, which is basically a wrapper around Docker. Um, so we don't directly use Docker, but it's basically like a wrapper. So it works just like Docker. Um, it's just the IBM version. So basically with a namespace, it helps if you have a big team, because if you want to put all your images in your namespace, like it's a lot easier. So mine's like our Deo. We have, I think, like 100 people on the team. So imagine if all of ours didn't have you know, our name or any indication of whose it was. So you just do namespace add, whatever you want to add your namespace. And then it'll just kind of give you this. And then your namespace is added. And then next, so you're going to build the image. So the next command I'm going to show you, it's in the IBM container registry, but it's also the same way you do like Docker build. So if you wanted to do, just do Docker and run it through Docker, you could also use this command. It's just going to be Docker build instead. So like I said, instead of the BXCR, you're going to do Docker build dash T is just the name. So whatever you want to name it. Um, so for IBM specifically, you need to have uh, the registry and then the region. So 
I'm assuming most of you would probably use like US, US South, so that's just NG, but if you're in Europe, like it's gonna be a different region and whatnot. And then the namespace, so, and then uh, whatever you wanna name it. So mine is like deploy React Kubernetes, name it whatever, um, and then this basically <coughs> just says, take my Docker file, build that image, and that's when I'm gonna get deployed. The dot at the end, so I'm already in the um, repo that I need to be, but you could also have like a file name as well, so if you're in the root, but you need to go to wherever the Docker file is, you could specify the file. And then it's just gonna do all the steps that it needs to, that your Docker file is basically telling it to, and then eventually build that image in the container registry. So next, run the image as a deployment. So there's two kinds of, two basic things within Kubernetes. There's deployments and there's services. So deployments basically you just run that container on a cluster, um, but then you need to expose that it's running. So it usually gives you like an IP, and that's what the service is for. So you do kubectl run app deployment. So the run basically says run my container on the cluster app deployment. It's just what I named it, so you guys can name it whatever you want, and then specify what image that you built previously. And then I'll just say that your deployment was created. So next, then you need to expose that deployment as a service. So this basically exposes the IP address that you're going to need to access it because without it, you know, you can't just access the container. Um, and then you'll do kubectl uh, expose deployment, whatever you name that app deployment. So I just named it app deployment. And then node port. So there's two ways you can expose things or use um, for the services with Kubernetes. There's node port as well as load balancer. For the first time, I would just suggest node port, but load balancers, <coughs> it's kind of more advanced, like it helps you, um, it automatically specifies like what, where it's getting exposed. Rather than node port, it's a little bit more simpler. If you don't have much traffic, it kind of does the job. And then the name of your service and then the port. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Um, in my Docker file and in this command, they were completely different. Um, and that's why I had to spend half a day trying to fix it when it was super simple. So just make sure that your Docker file and the support are the same. And then your service is gonna be then exposed. So this basically says, okay, I've deployed my application, now let's expose it to, so, some, so some of our users can access it. So then you access your application. So you obtain, how to obtain the public IP address of a cluster. Uh, so you have these workers, so you say, BXCS workers cluster name, so that basically just gives you um, all the worker nodes. So the workers are your nodes. Um, so if you only have one node, it's only gonna show one worker, so you copy and paste that public IP address it gives you. And then you need to get the node port of the service. So um, you do kubectl describe service, whatever you named your service, and that's gonna give you kind of like a YAML file of everything, all the configurations that your service has. And then you need to specifically get that node port and then combined, if you do the public IP address colon the node port, that's how you access it. So there's other ways you can do this. You could do it with a YAML file, which if you guys wanna see how to do it with a YAML file in that code pattern, there is one, but for the first time, like you don't really need it. Um, but if you wanna use like Load Balancer or Ingress or Redis or anything like that, the YAML file is really good. And then so now you have it up and running. So it's pretty simple steps. Um, I've tried it a few times and I haven't had any problems and other have, people have too, but that's just a basic way to get your stuff up and running. So next steps. So um, what I specifically want to do is, so I use Travis as my continuous integration tool. So if I just automatically deploy to Kubernetes in my CI tool, then any updates, like I don't, I don't have to touch Kubernetes at all, it just updates it every time. And then multiple containers, so this is only the front end you know, there's only one container, so I want to try and see how it would work with multiple containers, see how that all interacts. And then Istio, so how many people have heard of Istio? One, one person, okay. Um, so Istio is pretty new. Uh, basically what it does is it creates a service mesh over your Kubernetes cluster, and it provides a couple um, additional benefits to it. So one of the things is like A-B testing, so if you want if you have a version of your UI, let's say you have A and B, if you want to send 80% to A, 20% to B, let's say you're testing something out, you could automatically do that with Istio. 
So it makes it really good for developers because they don't really have to deal with it. And then um, it's just, so that's another YAML file. The Istio is a lot of YAML files. Um, other things it does is it does encryption between your containers and microservices. So, you know, it issues keys and whatnot. So it just adds that extra layer of security. And then um, if you want to test how your pods would react to a lot of traffic, or if you want to just like ping it, um, it has all those testing capabilities as well. So I just want to thank everyone for listening. Sorry about the uh, issues earlier, but if you guys want to look at the slides, they're available here. Um, and then there's the slides as well, as well as the GitHub repo of some of the resources. Are there any questions? No? Okay, cool, thank you everyone.